There's a story about a young man who was studying and studying and studying, studied world religions, studied all kinds of things, and finally decided he would go to a Zen master because he had this inner longing to understand the nature of things. And so finally he made his appointment and went to sit with the master and um, the master monk welcomed him in and said, please come sit, let us have tea. And so they made the tea and, you know, the, the student was just so brimming with questions, intelligent questions. This is his big shot to get the answers answered. And, and um, so as they were sitting, the master began pouring the tea and his little cup filled and his little cup continued to fill and overflow. And so finally the student said, what are you doing? It's full. And he said, you, my friend, are like this cup of tea. You must become empty if you want to experience more. So today I wanted to speak to you a little bit about a topic that I know much about. And that is about ignorance. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> My topic, here I am, baby. <laughs> this wonderful idea that ignorance is bliss, but I love this quote from Krishnamurti where he says, to know is to be ignorant. To not know is the beginning of wisdom. Isn't that beautiful? You see, we pride ourselves on what we know and what we believe. And in fact, over the ages, people have known so much about God that they felt perfectly justified in killing other people who had a different concept of God. That's when you know you're right, right? And so it's an interesting thing how we become so full of ourselves and our opinions about life and so I love that idea that says to us, perhaps the way is to become empty. Now what I know is for very many of us in this room, we have had to question reality, the nature of things. We, for whatever reason, because most of us did not grow up in this spiritual tradition, most of us found our way here. And so in that process, we began to either either having no religious background or training, we began to search for it, or having some religious background and training, as I did, began to search for something else. And so in that search, it's taken us uh, all kinds of different ways. But it's a wonderful thing to recognize that it is in our knowing that we become blind. I was reflecting recently, there's a wonderful phrase that says that our best thinking got us here. And I've kind of marveled, and this is not a political statement one way or the other, so just relax, but I'm sort of marveling that our, our, our government has spent a couple hundred million dollars to design a website and a program that doesn't work. You know, I could have done it for a hundred million dollars, you know, because I have a master's in ignorance, so I, you know, heck, I can do that. And I don't, you know, that's a whole big debate. In fact, part of the big debate is then people with opinions, and this opinion, people just talk past each other, right? Because that's what we do when we have our, our knowing. That we can just be so full of our opinion about reality that we talk right past others. And it seems to me that, and so I, I was just thinking, like, our best thinking got us here. How many of you have ever found yourself in a place of life and you went, how did I get here? <laughs> it wasn't like you woke up one morning and said, you know, let's take a left turn and see what that does, right? You just think, well, I'll do this and this makes sense and I'll do this. And then you look around and you go, what the heck happened to my life? And so it's a wonderful thing to be willing to enter into knowledge from that place of not knowing. I remember many years ago I was working 
with my father, and he had a consultant that came in, and he taught me a very valuable lesson. He said, it's a really powerful thing to say, I don't know. And so if you're in, involved in a conversation, um, it's wonderful to say, I don't know, even if you think you know. That's a little contrary to our ways of the world, isn't it? Some of us, I'm not going to name names, but one of them is on stage right now, is, um, <laughs> takes great pride in what he knows, right? And so I love this idea of becoming empty, of allowing something new to emerge. In the wonderful work that Byron Katie does, she really invites people to have a different experience of what they believe to be hold, hold sacred and true. And the first question she has people ask is, they state their, their situation, and she says, first question you want to ask is, is this true? That's a good question right there. That could spend, could spend some time with. And she says, if it is true, how do you know it's true? And so much of what we know to be true is not what we know to be true, it's what we assume to be true. Have you noticed that? And so when we grow up with a concept of reality, or we choose a concept of reality, and we are not willing to question that, then we find ourselves in places that we hadn't intended to go. Now, I'm always marvel. I love that I get to speak to a room full of people, of questioners. And I often like to say, don't take my word for it. In fact, as a general, don't take my word for it. <laughs> as a general, if I say anything, you may want to Google it first, because, you know, facts are fluid things with me. Um, <laughs> I just like information, whether it's real or not. You know, I'm, I'm good. But I love that we have permission to question. And so for many of us, for myself in particular, I grew up with a concept of God as rewarder and punisher. Kind of this divine being, this person who had apparently the time to watch everybody's lives and decide who was good and who wasn't and reward some and punish others. That was my concept of reality. That was my concept of God. And I tried, oh, I tried to be a good person. I wanted to be on the winning side of that equation. But I failed, right? And so it was in my questioning about that whole thing that I began to experience a different sense of this. And I always ask myself a question, which is, how is it that this one believes this, and this one believes this, and this one believes this. Aren't we really all talking about the same thing? And I made the mistake on more than one occasion to ask that question in Sunday school. It was not a welcome question, just in case you were wondering. And I struggled with that from an early age because I always had a sense of something more. Many years later, I was invited to a spiritual community, not unlike this one, where I began to experience something more. And I began to embrace a concept of the divine as not person, but as principle. In other words, not a person rewarding and punishing, but an intelligence that operated according to its own nature. And so there was an impersonal nature to the divine. This idea that we talk about so often about when we understand spiritual laws, we realize the, the, re, the universe is not rewarding or punishing us for our actions, but as Ernest Holmes says, we are rewarded or punished by our actions. In other words, when we are in alignment with the way things are, then greater good happens in our life. 
when we are in that place of flow, then our lives flow. But when we're in a place of limitation, we are cooperating with a universal intelligence to create that restriction in our lives. Not consciously, not like we wake up one morning and say, hey, what should I do to screw up my life today? <laughs> right? And so I began to embrace a way of being that was very, very different. But I began to understand as I researched and studied that there's a quality of the divine that we might call grace. And grace, again, my old understanding was grace was sort of like a reward given to me by God. But I came to understand and I believe that grace is a quality of the divine that I can embrace as I begin to be different. And so I was, I, I, I have, as over the years as I've studied different religious traditions, I'm, I'm struck by this common thread of different traditions that all have people who move into a state of grace, a state of awareness, a state of understanding. Now it's called different things, but most famous of course is Buddha, sitting under the Bodhi tree trying to figure out the nature of suffering. And eventually tried all kinds of different paths, but sat and said, I will sit here until I reach enlightenment. And then at some point, something opened up. I believe that Jesus had a very similar experience of a greater possibility, of a greater wisdom, of greater insight. I believe that Mohammed had an experience of the divine which channeled his writings. I believe that Paul had an experience of something. He was off persecuting Christians and then was riding along on his donkey or on some road and push, and all things became new. So this quality of our awakening, we might call it, of our cosmic consciousness, is a quality that is happening irrespective of spiritual tradition. Now, we call it a different name, we name it different ways, we refer to it in different ways, but it, for me, it is an awareness and an understanding that there is a greater reality, and when we peek into that insight and wisdom, we can see beyond the appearance of things. I also have found it interesting that in our three great Abrahamic re religious traditions, which are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they each have a very fundamental understanding, and they each have a very mystical understanding. And so in Judaism, they give us the Kabbalah. In Islam, we are given Sufism, and in Christianity, we were given Gnosticism, although the Christians did a pretty good job of almost stomping that out, right? And so on one hand, the literal mind can understand the nature of these teachings, do this, don't do that, 10 rules, you know, all that sort of thing. But in the mystical tradition, there is a whole different way of embracing reality. And so they speak to different parts of ourselves. So for those of us who have been on this path, I believe we're seeking that mystical understanding, that awareness of the presence of the divine that is our very life and being and that is transcendent of reality as we know it, that is transcendent of the forms that we experience. And for me, that quality is called grace. Now, one of the ways that grace comes about is by having a grateful heart. The word grace and the word gratitude actually come from the same root word. I think that's interesting. That we and we are in that place of understanding and awareness that it is in truth all divine, that everything is part of the whole. You see, there's something that happens for us that's expansive. Now, what I know is there's that part of us that is spiritually connected to something more, and there's that part of us that in some religious traditions are called the ego. And the ego thinks that we are separate. 
The ego believes in separation. The ego then believes and sees everything in terms of good and bad, better or worse, higher or lower, right? The ego identifies itself in the realm of form. Our ego says, look at me, aren't I great? I have accomplished this wonderful thing. Look at my resume. I must be okay, right? Look where I live. See my car. Watch how much money I have. See all these things. The ego says, see, I must be okay. But the spiritual aspect of ourself says we are okay because we exist. And we exist because of the one life that is expressing everywhere. So you may have noticed, as you've embarked on this spiritual path, that there are times when your ego completely freaks out. You notice that? Am I the only one? Okay. <clears throat> because one of the qualities of grace is grace delights in uncertainty. Yes, you heard that correctly. Grace delights in uncertainty. Deepak Chopra says, in the wisdom of uncertainty lies the freedom of our past. From the known, from the prison of past conditioning, uncertainty is the fertile ground of creativity and freedom. In other words, in order to create anew, we have to be willing to release what was. And it is a requirement of uncertainty that it causes discomfort, right? Every time we walk into a new situation, well, as we're becoming more enlightened, it becomes easier, but when it's a new situation, we don't know what it, how to be, what to expect, all that sort of thing, there's a part of us that goes, oh. And there comes this place in everyone's life, and it happens over and over again, by the way, but there comes a point in our lives when we are moving into the new, and it's not here yet. And we've left the old, and it is gone. And we're here. Comfortable, certain, right? No, 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 no. We're like, ah. You come to me when these moments, you come to our practitioners in these moments, I don't know, I don't know, my life, I was here and I was happy and this moment, like, get a tissue, it'll pass, right? <laughs> Actually, you should go to the practitioners, they're better at this whole... <laughs> They'll be loving and compassionate, you know. <laughs> but right? Because our ego is going crazy. I don't know what happened to my life. All I said was I want a new life. <laughs> and now I'm getting a new life. What is happening to my life? I don't understand. <laughs> Make it go away. But that part of us that can rest into the awareness that who we truly are is spiritual in nature, that our very life and being is more resident in this divine presence than it is in the realm of form. Then we can breathe into the uncertainty. Then we can breathe into the void. And it is in those places that we hold true to the vision of possibility that we have held for ourselves, knowing that it is inevitable for that to come forth. That is a quality of grace when we can simply trust and know that there is indeed the promise of all the ages of the spiritual intelligence that's working through us that does guide and does seek its highest self-expression through us. And so grace is transformative because when we have that awakening moment, even if it's just a glimpse, we cannot be the same. We cannot go back to our old way of being. we begin to understand. I think of the, the image of Paul, who in this experience saw a new way of being in the world. And rather than being against something, became for something greater. 
You see, when we glimpse the greater possibility, then we start to move in terms of being for something. The ego wants to be certain. The ego wants to hold an opinion and prove itself right. The spiritual self is willing to question. And so I find for each of us over and over as we're moving through this journey that, that we must be careful that we don't solidify. You see, by holding a firm opinion about things, we can talk our right, ourselves right out of our greater good. We say, I have a dream of what could happen for my life. I have a dream of who I can become. I have a dream of the impact I can make in the world. Isn't that lovely? And then the ego comes rushing in and says, but, and gives you your preformed opinion about what is possible, how things work, all of that limitation. So truly, as Krishnamurti says in this wonderful quote, is to not know is the beginning of wisdom. I love the question of asking myself, if what I thought was true wasn't true, what might be possible? Right? If all of my limitating, uh, limitations and my ideas about how things are weren't really true, what becomes possible for me, for this community, for this world? And so maybe it would behoove me to re-question what is? Rumi wrote this beautiful poem. Again, Rumi is from the Sufi tradition. And it's, this particular poem is called Quietness. And he says, inside this new love, die. Your way begins on the other side. Become the sky. Take an axe to the prison wall. Escape. Walk out like someone suddenly born into color. Do it now. You're covered with thick cloud. Slide out the side. Die and be quiet. Quietness is the surest sign that you have died. Love that. Your old life was a frantic running from silence. The speechless full moon comes out now. You see, spiritual teachers through the ages have tried to help us to understand that our own mind becomes the prison or the liberator of who we are. It is the, it is the prison that we have built around ourselves through blocks called belief systems, limiting belief systems. And then we say, well, I can't do anything because I'm in this prison. But Rumi says, takes an axe to the wall, which is to say, break through what has been. Embrace your greater possibility. Listen to that still, small voice that is calling you forward for your highest self-expression. All of the great teachers in all the mystical traditions have helped us to understand we are more than we think we are. That we can experience life as a grace-filled experience. Which is not to say it's always going to be pleasant or always going to be comfortable. But it is in the knowing that all things work together for our highest good. And when we can move into that experience of the divine with a sense of grace and with a sense of gratitude, then we are not dismayed by the things of the world, but rather we are illuminated by the things of spirit. So I honor you. I'm particularly mindful that this is not an easy path that we have chosen. This is not a nice, neat, clean path. Step one, step two, step three, step four, five, you're done. Sunday you celebrate, right? It's messy and it's icky and it's ugh. You know, I, uh, the image I've shared before but I kind of love is this idea, you know, we all know the story of the caterpillar 
And the caterpillar goes and, and it, you know, life's cool. Just enjoying eating, eating a leaf here, eating a leaf there, climbing here, climbing there. Life's good. And then some inner divine discontent that we cannot fully be understand says, you must go go into the cocoon. Why wouldn't I? So they go, they build the cocoon, and they are in a process of metamorphosis to become the butterfly. But science tells us that when that nice little furry caterpillar goes into the cocoon, a very interesting process happens. It dissolves. It becomes ugh. I don't know if that's the technical term, but <laughs> it becomes a slimy, ooey, gooey thing. So, you know, if you were to knock on the cocoon and say, how are things going? <laughs> my guess is like, I don't know what happened. I was just being a caterpillar and enjoying my life and having leaves and then something said. And yet, what we know is the beauty comes through that experience. Some of us may be entering the cocoon or in the cocoon right now. Some of us may feel as if it's all dissolving and getting really ooky right now. And what I ask you and invite you to know is what the great spiritual teachers through the ages have taught us is there's a greater wisdom, a greater possibility, life seeking its highest self-expression. And when we can put our faith in that, not in who we were and not even in the cocoon that surrounds us, but in that divine intelligence that is recreating itself so that we might spread our rings and fly, then we find a greater faith and a greater possibility emerging. So wherever you are on that journey, just know that you are loved and supported in being fully who you are. Let us pray. As we simply surrender in this moment, and by surrender I mean opening up, not giving up. Opening to that divine and infinite wisdom, that divine and infinite intelligence, that one life that is our very life and being. And as we open our hearts, we experience unconditional love. As we open our minds, we experience divine wisdom. And when we open our hearts and our minds and our soul, we experience grace. The awareness of this greater life, this greater possibility, this greater something that is indeed seeking its highest self-expression through us right here and right now. And so as I speak this word of truth, I'm simply recognizing and knowing the what is. That love is seeking its awareness and its self-expression through us. That divine love is healing and transforming our relationships our sense of self, our sense of being. Ernest Holmes said that love is the self-givingness of spirit. And so we are allowing that presence to give itself into the fullness of our being. We are recognizing divine wholeness expressing through every cell and every system as health and well-being and vitality. We are simply knowing in this moment that we are abundant beings right here and right now, for we live in a divine wisdom and intelligence that is abundant by its very nature. And so joyously we give, graciously we receive of the divine bounty, allowing our lives to fill and overflow with that greater good. We speak the word of truth this day as we bless this spiritual community and all that inhabit it. For we know that we are divinely guided into perfect right action, that we are unfolding in ways of peace and joy and love and harmony. We extend a blessing, as we always do, to all priests, all rabbis, all ministers, all teachers of every faith. For we recognize and know the many pathways to the divine. We extend a blessing to our brothers and sisters around the planet this day. We're simply holding the high watch, the high vision for a world that works for everyone, where love and beauty and compassion are the order of the day. We hold the high vision for a planet at peace, in harmony with itself. 
we are willing to be the ambassadors of greater good in the world. And for this, I am truly grateful. And so even as I speak this word, I know that there is a law of mind operating upon this consciousness established, bringing forth the highest good for all concerned, in perfect timing and in divine right order. And so it is with a sense of joy and gratitude that I simply give thanks that this is so, as together we say, and so it is. Amen.